just the reason it's it's so important is that we support children and young people to strategically engage with decision makers um, in a really sustainable and meaningful way. And we do that sort of through a variety of ways. So we support sort of sector awareness around identifying participation groups. Um, we support professionals and practitioners with a range of learning events and resources and our audit tool. And of course, sort of sharing news and events and engagement opportunities. And then at the very heart of what we do is the work that we um, deliver for children uh, and young people, which we co-produce with the FLAIR National Advisory Group which is delivered and coordinated by CDC, um, as well as our regional kids groups. And then we sort of give children and young people a range of opportunities to be heard through social media and blogs, etc. Um, as well as sort of things like roundtable meetings where we support them to engage directly with decision makers. So I just wanted to very quickly sort of run through MPW to give you a quick idea um, of why we are here and everybody will get these slides at the end of today so don't worry about taking notes or taking pictures of the slides or anything you will get them directly um, from us later on so today we are thinking about how we design and deliver engaging and effective online participation thinking about where that uh, aligns and differs with face-to-face -face participation um, and to discuss sort of different online mediums and tools that lead to effective participation thinking about um, sort of where we need to be interactive to engage children and young people. And also, of course, we're going to be thinking about safeguarding. We'll mention that throughout, but also specifically at the end as well in some dedicated slides. All right. So in terms of our online engagement, obviously the past nine to ten months have been particularly challenging in getting everybody online and thinking about how we work collaboratively in a virtual environment. Um, and we have probably been using the words online and digital and virtual interchangeably over the past few months. They are they are different things, but for the purposes of today, we will use them all um, all, all as one um, in terms of how we are thinking about engaging with children and young people. Um, because I think if uh, thinking about them all as one supports us to understand that we are actually probably a lot further along with our engagement with children and young people than we think we are. So there are already lots of existing things that we will be doing online to support the uh, support the, how our services reach children and young people and their families. So obviously things like newsletters and social media sites and websites and videos and podcasts and, and, and all of that, that's all old hat. And we've been doing that in a range of different ways for a long time. So technically they are outreach tools, but I think the, the massive advantage of having them already established is that we can then use our outreach tools to build trust and engagement with our service users because they will recognise the ways that we are already trying to engage with them through sharing information with them. So things like obviously newsletters and social media and et cetera, they are information delivery tools, but they can be really effective in sharing what we are doing to engage with children and young people and encouraging them to work with us. So to give you an example of that, the uh, and there are lots of sort of different examples. I've just sort of picked two because they work in the same way, but they have very different audiences. So the first example is IROC East Sussex, which are a service delivery organisation supporting children and young people. And Charlotte, would you mind just popping the link for that Instagram account into the chat box? Um, people on the chat, please do feel free to click on the links, etc. as I'm talking. Um, like I said, you'll get all these slides, etc. So if you'd like to sort of have a look at some of the actual examples online, please do. So IROC, as I mentioned, they are service delivery. So they are trying to engage with their audience in a really fun and engaging and uh, young people friendly way. So they have created video content, they have funny photos, they have engaging animations, they use um, really uh, gentle pictures to sort of share information with young people and encourage them to think about their well-being. And then they also use Instagram to say, come and, come and see what we can offer you. And so it's a really nice way of 
doing both the outreach and the engagement in one channel. And then the other example that I've just popped up on this slide is, is National Children's Bureau, of which CDC is a part. So obviously National Children's Bureau is a policy organisation. It's very, very different to IROC, but we do engage with children and young people because we want to uh, deliver participation and co-production with them. So you'll notice on the NCB channels that our young people posts and our professional posts are very different to each other. We have specific young people branding that supports children and young people to understand which uh, to visually sort of connect with our uh, content for them. It's very user friendly, it's um, colourful, it sort of catches the eye, it encourages young people to find out more about what we're doing and to use that look at our other social media channels. Whereas the young, uh, the practitioner uh, content that we'll produce is very much, we have written a report on this, you can find it here. So as you can see, it's got its very different tone to it. Let's give you a second to have a look at those. Whilst I do that, I'll pop up a picture of the Lundy model. So the Lundy model, which I've just popped up on the slide here, is an example of where face-to-face -face participation and online participation mirror each other. So obviously uh, this model, um, I say obviously, it's only obvious if you know. Um, so the Lundy model was developed in 2007. So obviously it's around face-to-face -face engagement and working with children and young people in um, in-person spaces. But the principles around this are exactly the same. So the Lundy model works on the principle that we often talk about children and young people's voice. So we talk about we want to, we want to access young people's voice. We want young people to have a voice. We want them to be able to share their voice. But actually, on its own, voice is meaningless because you're just speaking into a void. So what we need to do with online participation tools is make sure that we are providing uh, appropriate space, the right audience and the correct way to influence decision makers so that children and young people can meaningfully engage and co-produce in our work. And like I said, that is exactly the same as what we would do if we were, would be planning face to face engagement. We want them to have a voice, so we need to make sure we're providing them with, as I said, the space, the audience and the influence to have that, uh, to make sure that their voice is meaningfully heard. Um, and so sort of just to give you sort of a bit of a background around this, obviously it's all centred around Article 12, which is obviously the right to, um, to be heard and to have your views given. Um, that's the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, and Laura Lundy is a academic from the uh, Queen's University in Belfast, and she's a professor of international children's rights. Um, so she has done a lot of work around how you co-produce uh, engagement models with children and young people. So, so moving on. So again, this is just a quick example of how CDC had to adapt from our face-to-face -face engagement to our online engagement at the, uh, the beginning of the uh, spring term and as we went into lockdown. So um, what you can see in front of you is a screenshot of an online meeting that we had with the children's minister back in July. We were, um, this is something that normally uh, we would do face to face. We would normally spend a sort of couple of weeks planning this meeting, uh, working out with the young people, how we would sort of logistically get them down to London to meet face to face with the minister. We would normally sort of spend quite a long time planning it. And then in reality, you have about 20 minutes to actually speak to the minister before they have to go off and do something else. Um, but actually moving this online proved quite advantageous for us. So we were able to sort of coordinate with the young people about the platform that worked best for them, that we could share that with, with the minister and say we needed to use this one because this one worked for the young people. Um, obviously we cut down on all of the travelling, which made it much easier for young people to commit to the meeting. We were able to work with them sort of in advance about what they would want to say and who sort of who they, who was going to say what and when. Um, and everybody was able to contribute to the meeting in their own uh, their own way and on their own terms. So you'll notice uh, if you look really closely at the bottom right of the screenshot that one of our young people has chosen to have their camera off, which allows them to feel more comfortable and confident um, to engage. Um, and it's just sort of one of the benefits for moving to online engagement for some young people um, 
you know, some young people are really reluctant to be in a room and to, to engage with people face to face. But online, when they can control some of their environment, it makes it much more um, positive and relaxing for them. So sort of one of the highlights that we've had to sort of um, that has come out of having to move on all of our uh, practice online over the past couple of months. So thinking about uh, designing online engagement, again, these five bullet points here are exactly the same as face to face engagement. It doesn't change. You're just thinking actually about maybe the tools that you've got at your disposal. So thinking about your audience and who you're wanting to engage with will really help you to think about the ways in which you do that. So if you're working with very young children, obviously they don't use social media. They have no particular awareness of tools and platforms and whiteboards and things. But what they really like to do is craft activities. They like to use online drawing tools, perhaps, or use virtual storytelling platforms. Teenagers are much more likely to have preferences about how they like to engage and where they like to engage and when they want to engage. So they'll probably want to use platforms that are already familiar to them. Um, so having a think about actually whether those platforms are possible for us to use and whether they're, they're safe to use in an online uh, engagement forum. Also thinking about sort of purpose. So sort of are you wanting to engage service users in consultation or inform guidance etc or are you wanting to be more collaborative with them and actually create participation and co-production opportunities because again that will think that will influence how how you're engaging with them and, um, and what platforms you're using uh, exactly the same with outcomes you know, face-to-face -face meetings, you might have something that you would sort of go away and produce or sort of create within the meeting and exactly the same with, with online participation. So you're thinking about actually what outputs do you want at the end of the meeting and can you use your online space to create those outputs as you're going along or do you need to take that information, go away, create it and then come back and um, get the young people to review it again. I think you also need to think about practicalities of online engagement and, and these are exactly the same as face to face considerations. So I've mentioned that one of our young people felt much more confident to engage because they could have their camera off. And that is a brilliant benefit of the past few months. It's, you know, it's hard to find a lot of silver linings, um, you know, you know, since March, but for some young people, being able to engage online has allowed them to do so many more things. For example, participate in the annual review meetings. They've been able to use online platforms to um, participate in ways that, that are comfortable for them, using the, the functions of the platform in ways that work for them. Um, but just like face to face meetings don't work for everybody, online meetings don't work for everybody also. So we need to be mindful about creating um, proactive, active engagement opportunities for young people who find engaging online difficult or who have specific barriers. So one of those barriers might be around digital poverty. So have a think about whether you need to hire a specific kit or adapt your platforms to make allowances for the technology that people do have. Um, also thinking about whether you might need to pay for data for young people to participate because obviously not everybody has reliable Wi-Fi. You're thinking about privacy as well. So some issues are particularly sensitive for children and young people, and they might not want to discuss them in an open space with other people at home. So you need to have a think about giving them opportunities to engage in spaces where there's not um, lots of people around them. So that might be that, you know, you need to um, hire com uh, rooms in youth centres or in remote working spots for young people to go and use while should you're uh, delivering online engagement. Uh, you're thinking about children and young people with complex needs. So who do they have at home or at school to support them to engage online? Um, and timings of meetings as well. So it can take a lot longer to cover content online. So you need to have a think about um, how long your meeting is going to be and how fatiguing that content is going to be for young people. So be realistic and find that balance about what you can cover and when. Um, and lastly, around inclusion. 
So we asked our FLAIR members at the very, very beginning of lockdown um, in March to tell us how we, they, we could include them online. And so I guess this is an example of, um, of how you can co-produce really quick things online that you know might not look slick and glossy, but actually do the job around sort of communicating young people's needs. Uh, and it's also about how you can make sure that you're being inclusive for children and young people. I'm, I'm going to attempt to play this. When I played it in the last session, you couldn't hear the sound, but fingers crossed um, it's going to work this time around. It's, this is very, very quick. When you're in an online meeting, it's important to avoid using jargon and to help with this, it is very useful to always send out the meeting agenda a couple of days beforehand. This will help to ease any anxiety. Be aware that everyone works at their own pace. In meetings, please remember to speak clearly. In a group meeting, have a system so everyone has a chance to speak. In order to make sure that everyone can understand and process what information people are saying, pause regularly when speaking. When in a big meeting, ask people to speak one at a time. Make sure that everyone gets the chance to speak when there's a large meeting. If you're in a long meeting, make sure that people have the option to take regular breaks away from screens. In meetings, not everyone wants to be having their camera on. In a system of talking, I think you should raise your hands to let people know that you're about to talk. So that everyone can participate, make sure you ask what sort of media they prefer to communicate on. Ask everyone to be muted unless they're speaking. Be patient with us, especially when you're asking us to talk about new concepts that may be confusing, so we can take time to digest them, and together we can make things better. Okay. So just a really quick example of, um, yeah, as I mentioned, sort of ways that you can engage with young people to help create content that make sure that they're included in their own way, um, in the ways that work best for them, I should say. Um, and so finally, before I hand over to Charlotte, I just wanted to talk about dedicated spaces. So it's really important that online spaces for young people um, are available where it's just for young people. And we're not trying to ask them to join professionals meetings all the time. And this sort of, again, echoes what we would do for face to face delivery. We want to give children and young people the opportunity to talk with other children and young people um, in a really open way. That's, that sort of allows them to explore issues without practitioners there for the, them to then decide what content they want to share with practitioners. Um, they don't always want to be joining professionals meetings um, because, and I'm going to be honest, they could be really boring for young people and very inaccessible, particularly when you start talking about um, minute detail and policy policy detail. That, is, that That's not something that children and young people find engaging. So we need to be able to create mechanisms for them uh, where we can share service users' voices in ways that suit them best. So do be creative and do ask children and young people and, and their families about how they want to share their voices. They will come up with lots of different ideas about ways that work for them. Um, and that's, I guess, uh, sort of one of those examples is uh, the Children and Young People's uh, Youth Voice Matters Conference that we run as part of making participation work. So the next one is in February half term. Um, and these are dedicated spaces for children and young people for, to come together and to learn about participation skills and how they can engage with strategic decision makers. Um, we normally deliver them face to face. We normally rent out a venue somewhere in England and we have sort of, you know, 70 or 80 young people or so come together to share their learning and sort of join in on workshops. Obviously, that's not possible at the moment. That's not something that we can um, sort of safely deliver. So we have taken the conference online. We are going to see how well we can coordinate large groups of children and young people all in one space, all together. I think we've 
got about 200 young people signed up to this conference at the moment. So we'll have to wait and see how we how that works in principle. But hopefully there's lots of practice that we might be able to share with with you all after the um, after the half time break. Charlotte, do you want to pick up from uh, how we might be able to deliver some of this content? Yeah, great. Um, thanks, Joe. So for this sort of next section, we're going to be thinking about the delivery of the content. And so Joe's spoken about thought like thought process before designing it and the process behind it. And so now we're going to think what you can put in the session to encourage young people's participation and engagement. Um, so we know that sitting at home or sitting in an office on your own can feel quite isolating, especially when you're trying to work collaboratively, um, especially when you're in a group of children, and young people. So it's really important to use tools that match the purpose of the session and tools that will help participants to connect to each other. Um, and one way you can begin this is ask participants what they would like to do. What have they had an online learning session at school or done something with their friends interactively that worked really well for them? Um, an example of what we've done recently through engaging children, young people online is using a Miro board, which is an interactive whiteboard. And as you can see on the slide, it's just there and it's got pictures, post-it notes, text options. There's lots of things you can use it, use it for. Um, and it's worked really well in our young people's advisory group meetings. Um, you can use memes, photos and GIFs um, just to make it a bit more visually appealing as well. Um, using videos is another really good way to engage children and young people, but it's important to bear in mind if you're using a video in a session, um, not to make it too long, because we've definitely heard from children and young people themselves that if they've been in an online class that they find it a lot easier to get distracted when there's just a pre-recorded video. Um, so making sure that it's no longer than 10 minutes um, and is engaging. Um, and you should always have an alternative for engaging online and have an alternative way that children, young people can share their thoughts with you. Um, Joe spoke earlier about digital poverty and different access needs. And so if you just have one sort of way of people to interact online that might not be accessible for everybody. Um, and I know that if they're using a smartphone for a Zoom meeting, they have to sort of click out of a Zoom meeting and open up a new browser um, to access links that are posted. So a lot of young people just prefer to verbally contribute. Um, and so it's just making sure that all of your activities are inclusive. Um, so yeah, be mindful of access needs and always present this alternative to share their thoughts. Um, make it lively. This is really, really important as it is with face to face meetings, having breaks and using icebreakers to keep the energy going. Um, I think everyone knows that sort of Zoom fatigue is definitely real and it's definitely a thing. And if young people have had online classes or have had different consultations online to then jump to your meeting with another online session can be quite draining for them. So making sure that icebreakers and breaks are included in them. Um, icebreakers don't need to be online tools and platforms. You can do activities such as bring your own sort of object, highlighting something fun that you've done recently or you're looking forward to do. Um, and I would say icebreakers, especially in groups where you don't know, they don't know each other as well, or maybe you've recruited a new member to the group virtually, um, is really important to get them feeling connected to each other. Um, so try and keep the activities as interactive as possible um, and building in lots of breaks just to make sure it's all lively still. Thanks, Joe. Um, dates and timings for sessions are really, really important to bear in mind when you're scheduling them. Um, it's the same where and when questions that apply to online engagement to face to face engagement. Your service users have really busy lives, um, lots of different responsibilities. Um, and a combination of this. And so making sure that you're offering alternatives, alternative days, alternative times um, to your session so participants can choose themselves the best option. Using a doodle poll is a really good way and a really accessible way for children, young people to be able to have the decision making around when the session happens and what time. And as services and practitioners who are seeking young people's engagement, we have to be the really flexible party at the other end. So this may mean 
working outside of hours, working on weekends to sort of fit the timetables of the young people and their families. Thanks, Joe. Feedback. Um, feedback is really, really important and you should always, always give feedback on how you're using children, young people and their families, thoughts, suggestions and experiences. Um, as an example of using a sort of creative way of feedback, as you can see on the slide, there's a graphic facilitation of event myself and Joe um, co-facilitated back in March. Um, and it's just a really visual, engaging way that children, young people can see what they've talked about and can see the impact of that sort of on a page itself. Um, and so it's important to be creative. It doesn't have to be a report um, and that's just sort of submitted to them. It can be in the form of different graphics, designs, timelines, sort of anything that is accessible to them. And it's also important to bear in mind that if you can't use their feedback for whatever reason, be honest with them. So they're sort of going through the journey that that their thoughts have been shared with. Um, thanks, Joe. So platforms and websites for engagement. I'm going to post a link to a Padlet, which is quite similar to a Miro board. It's an online interactive sort of whiteboard and tool. And I'll give you just a couple minutes just to have a look at it and open that link. Um, it's just some online platforms and websites that might be useful to you when planning online engagement. Um, and we're not endorsing any of them or signing them off because it's important to think individually about safeguarding and risk assessments before you use any of these tools in online engagement. But I'll just give you a chance to have a look at them. Um, and if you have any tools or platforms that you'd like to share, please do add them to the Padlet. Also, I think a couple of people have asked around free resources. Um, so just to sort of mention that um, most of these platforms will have a have a option of sort of a limited free platform um, versus a costed um, platform that you can use, which has additional or higher functionality. I think it's worth bearing in mind that whilst uh, some of these tools do cost money, you are say you are potentially saving money um, from young people's travel. You might be saving money from refreshments um, and lunch costs. You might also be saving money around um, hiring meeting venues. So it's well worth sort of thinking about how you might be able to repurpose some of those some of those costs if it's possible for you to do so. Um, and also think about actually you might be able to use these tools in your professional delivery as well. So if you are delivering workshops with colleagues, if you have um, online meetings that you want to sort of work with colleagues on, then you can use these tools for this, you know, for the same purpose. Charlotte and I use Padlet and Miro for both young people and for our um, practitioner engagement as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, and just another thing to flag that some platforms such as WhatsApp, Instagram, TikTok do have age limits on them. So um, children and young people may be using them anyway, but you need to sort of weigh up the use of these platforms if they're familiar with them versus the legal requirements of the site. Um, and so that's something to think about, especially in terms of safeguarding as well, um, how the different online platforms allows users to interact and connect with each other. So with WhatsApp, it makes all participants numbers visible to one another um, and that's the same in Teams. Um, all groups can sort of access each other's email address and contact details. Um, so this is just important to bear in mind when you're using an online platform or tools with children, and young people. Thanks, Joe. Um, so this ties us really nicely into the next section, which is keeping engagement safe. Um, the list here on the slide is not exhaustive and it's definitely just a starter, but just some really important points to bear in mind is that all of your engagement activity, whether it's face to face or online, should adhere to your organisation's safeguarding policies and legal requirements. So you may need to work with your organisation's safeguarding lead to update these existing policies um, and transfer them from face to face to online digital engagement. 
And so this includes your engagement and social media policy if you're using social media for your engagement with children and young people. Um, staff delivering engagement for children, young people and vulnerable adults should always be DBS checked and you should have a risk assessment for all meetings that includes plans of how to escalate any safeguarding needs um, and so risk assess the platforms before you use them. So I know that teams have just updated and got a breakout room function so you need to risk assess this if you're going to be using this function in your online meetings. Um, and it's important to bear in mind that risk assessments don't stop you doing things or don't stop engagement. They allow you to do them safely. And as with face to face delivery, you'll need a minimum of two staff there. Um, if there was an immediate safeguarding issue, the second adult can take the young person aside or things like digital issues, you know, Internet connection dies down or just the platform dies down for some reason, um, it's really important that you have somebody there with the session plan who's able to take over from you. Pre-meeting sessions um, settings and platform settings. Um, a couple of points to bear in mind is always turn on the waiting room so you can control who comes in to the meeting. Um, at CDC, we send children and young people an invitation to register for the meeting. So we know exactly who we're expecting and know exactly who to admit to the meeting. Um, be aware of usernames. A lot of children and young people are obviously using online platforms like Zoom to stay connected with their friends and sometimes their username is inappropriate or it's just something that's a joke and so it's not quite work appropriate. Um, in meeting settings is always make sure there's a staff member to co-host so as a the same similar reasons why you need two members there is if something was to go wrong, then the co-host can take over from the host. Um, lock the meeting. Once participants have arrived, you can lock the meeting and there will be no unwanted attendees and control screen sharing. So make sure that they don't have the option to share their screen or sh share something inappropriate. Um, and location, location, location is really, really important. And so for safeguarding reasons, um, it's discouraged that children and young people use their bedroom. But obviously we understand that sometimes there's no alternative. Um, so you need to make sure that you're risk assessing this properly and you work with the group to understand what is appropriate. Um, and consent. So you must collect all usual consent for engagement online as you would do for a face to face meeting. Um, and if you're going to be recording the meeting or taking screenshots for social media or making a video, you'll need the media consent from them as well, um, which is really important to bear in mind for all of your online meetings. So just a massive thank you for joining our second workshop of the day. Um, and please do get in touch to discuss any support needs. Joe's emails there and we'll be circulating the slides as well so you'll have have everything that we've covered um, from the session today and finally if you would like to join the making ourselves heard forum so this is a forum that we host for practitioners and professionals to sort of share any participation and co-production challenges successes um, resources and it's just a platform for shared learning and sort of peer support so if you scan the QR code here, it will take you to a web page to register to join. And I will also be posting a link in the chat box for the evaluation of today's event. So we'd be really grateful if you could fill that out. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Um, yes, and as Charlotte just said, thank you to all of you for participating um, and joining us this afternoon. I hope you have found it useful. If there is anything that you would like to know around um, young people's engagement, whether it's face to face or online, or if you'd like to have some more info about making participation work, please do get in touch. We'd be really happy to talk to you um, about any sort of support needs um, and what we might be able to help with and what we can signpost you on to. So, yeah, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. You're really welcome. Um, I don't know if there are any further instructions about whether you're going back to a main room or anything. I'm assuming not. Um, Charlotte's nodding ahead, so, so that's I it. So, you're um, right. <laughs> yeah.
Brilliant. Thank so enjoy your afternoons, everybody. I hope this, um, like I said, has, has been useful. Um, and yeah, the Friday afternoon, uh, hopefully it was not too onerous for, for all of you. So yeah, thank you very much and take care. Thank you. Bye bye. I'll, I'll email some query, uh, some questions. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Bye bye. And I will stop recording. Perfect.